Most of us like hearing stories because they're engaging and they're easy to remember. Well, Jesus was a master storyteller and I'm convinced there's so many parables in the gospels because that's what the disciples remembered. The teaching that came from those stories really stayed with them. But what if you know that that story is challenging your life, how you live? And he's actually asking you to front up to something in your character that needs to change. Maybe then we don't like the story quite so much. This is a story of a wedding. My daughter, a couple of months ago, was maid of honor for her best friend's wedding down at Port Elliot. It rained on the day, but never mind. It was supposed to be on those beautiful memorial gardens there on the foreshore, but it was at the Institute. We still had a wedding. But the bride and groom had only met about five and a half months before they got married, and they were only engaged for just over two and a half months. So you can imagine this mad panic in those couple of months, trying to organize venues, outfits, bridal showers, everything that goes into a wedding. It was crazy, but it was beautiful on the day. In Jewish culture, it's a little different to that. As soon as the couple announced that they were going to get married, an invitation was sent out. You are invited to come to the wedding feast. But there was no date. There was no time on the invitation. You just knew you were invited. And the groom would go off and he'd build a house for his bride. And when everything was prepared, the house, the meal, then suddenly the second invitation was issued, come now everything is ready and you would just leave everything and you would go and enjoy the wedding. Well, this isn't just any ordinary wedding in this parable. It's actually the king's son who's being married. Now, I've never had the privilege, but I imagine if the prime minister of Australia invited one of us to dine or the queen of England or any world leader, that the right response would be to say, thank you, I would love to come. And then you'd get dressed in your best, you'd appear at the right time, and you'd enjoy the event together. Slightly different response in this parable. The listeners don't know it, but it's the king of kings who's inviting them and said, the invitation's gone out, now's the time to come. It's interesting to read the responses. They're either brazenly rude, as in verse five, it says they paid no attention. They simply went off about their daily tasks. Or verse six tells us they were absolutely murderous. It says they seized, they mistreated, and they killed the messengers. Amazing, appalling. The religious leaders listening to Jesus tell this story were well aware of what happened to the prophets God sent to their forefathers. They were also well aware of how they had treated Jesus' son, Jesus' son, no, Jesus' cousin, I mean, sorry. <laughs> oh, phew, where'd I get that from? The son of God, but Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. They'd made no murmur of complaint when he was seized, imprisoned, beheaded. They were probably secretly glad to be rid of him. And the message, you need to repent. You need to change your ways. You need to fall on your face before God and admit your sinfulness and change your ways. Not a message they wanted in their self-righteousness to hear. You know, that, that set of activities chosen by the first group of people, they weren't bad in and of themselves. There was a field to plow. There was a business to run. But just like we had illustrated in this example here, there was no time in their lives for what should have been the biggest priority, where God was first and foremost in life. Other things had been allowed to fill that space, 
things that brought them money, things that brought them self-satisfaction. For other people, there's a willful contempt that anybody has the right to tell me how I should live my life. I wonder if you've met people like that. They're often quite hard, often quite sad people, really, though they won't admit it. The story is told many years ago in the colonial era of an African chief who'd offended the British government. So they sent a gunboat to punish him. A runner brought the chief the news that the gunboat had entered the river that led to their village. Well, the chief didn't want to hear that news, so he had the runner killed. The next day, a second runner came to tell the chief, the gunboat's not very far away, we need to leave now to escape. Well, the chief didn't want to hear that news either, so he had the second runner killed. But that didn't stop the gunboat, didn't delay the day of judgment. And it wasn't long before there was this thunderous boom of the cannons echoing through the jungle and that village collapsed like cardboard. To kill the messenger doesn't change the message, doesn't delay it, doesn't make any difference. And whether we violently reject or simply indifferently neglect, there is a day coming. We've all been invited. God loves us, each and every one, unique as we are. There's a place at the table if you'll accept the invitation to come. In the ancient world, a wedding, and especially a royal one, was eagerly anticipated, typically, because it was such a break to the hard labour of everyday life. And it's hard to think, who wouldn't want to come? Who wouldn't want to be there? And as a Christian, you know, I always find, who wouldn't want to know God in this life? The joy, the peace, the love that we experience and can share when we're in tune with the one who made us and loves us enough to give his son for us. Well, the king's son deserved to have lots of excited guests at his wedding. So the invitation is extended more broadly. Anyone, everyone who's willing to come, there is an invitation. You come, come to the wedding feast, come now. Everything is ready for you to enjoy this feast. And so people did from all professions, from all walks of life, people came. The custom was that the king would provide suitable clothing for the guests to wear. So the poor wouldn't feel conspicuous and even the rich couldn't match the grandeur of the king's provision. But as the king mingles, he notices there's one, there's always one, isn't there? There's one guest who has refused the king's clothing and thinking that his own attire was perfectly appropriate and quite suitable. Coming to the wedding feast involved being bathed and then clothed in the beautiful king's garments and he hadn't done either of those. I don't know if you've met people like this but some people in life somehow think that their good deeds should impress God, that you can come. So long as your good somehow outweighs the bad, they think you're in, surely you're in. God didn't give his son for your good deeds to be good enough because they never are. And the Bible tells us when you put your good deeds, your absolute best against the purity and the holiness of God, they the good deeds look like filthy rags in comparison. That's, that's a little bit noticeable in a crowd of people clothed in grand garments. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. We celebrated at communion, Jesus has cleansed us. He's offering us his righteousness in exchange for our filthy rags. 
He says it's freely given. All you need to do is come. It's for everyone, anyone, the good, the bad, the thief on the cross. It's for everyone. You simply have to come in humility, recognising my life needs to change. I need to be clothed with the goodness of God through his son. The stone that the builders rejected is in fact the cornerstone, the key to all of life. He's the foundation that makes life work. He's the one that can lead us for all of life into eternity, clothed in his goodness. You know, that's the message that all of our partners are sharing around the globe. I'm always inspired when I hear their stories. In February, in Bangladesh, the Barnabin Hills Churches of Christ meet for their annual general meeting each year, and they set their goals for the year. And the first one really challenges me. They beg for God. They pray for God. God, help us to find 200 people who will hear the word, the truth of who you are, and will come in repentance and faith and be ready for that day when that second invitation is going out. And then they construct, or well, their goal is to construct five church buildings. They want to print the Bible in Peru, which is one of the most marginalised, disadvantaged people groups in Bangladesh. And they uh, print songbooks as well, because often they're illiterate. So if you can have a songbook and you know that word that you're singing looks like that, they can actually learn to read through the songs they sing. And they want to develop their youth ministry, young people coming through with passion for God and develop their leadership training centre. And at that annual general meeting, there were six young people who were baptised, standing up to be strong Christian leaders in their church. They've already constructed two of those five churches this year and beautiful people like Elder Zygman and his wife faithfully visit the Maru and bring the truth of God's love prayerfully to them. In Papua New Guinea, we train Christian leaders and that's Scandet Bible College, the graduates from last year. Just before graduation, they received a message from a village way up in the northeast of the Western Highlands saying, would you send us somebody who can preach and teach us about God? What a beautiful invitation to get to a Bible college. Now you might think, well, that's easy. They're in Papua New Guinea and this village is in Papua New Guinea, but actually they're like different nations within their own country. There are many different language groups. Pastor Killian, who responded, speaks APAL. The group that he was invited to come to speak to is mum speaking. There'll be many cultural differences, but he's given his life to serve God and to take that message there. Each Easter, we do a Walk for Hope, we call it, um, campaign where we raise funds for those who are having uh, leadership training for church leaders, those who are going out in evangelism, pastors, and church planting. And although we haven't been out of visit for the last couple of years, and that's been tough for our partners and for us, not being able to go and encourage and be with them and be encouraged by them, um, we still chose the theme of thankfulness in all things. Now, the last few years have been quite difficult for our partners as well as for us in Australia as people have struggled with COVID and lockdowns and what that means in a country where you don't have a government that's going to give you handouts while you're in lockdown. You depend on what you earn every day to eat every day. That's been really tricky. But we chose the theme of thankfulness because it is the secret to joy gratitude for just the small things in life. If you can find things to be thankful for, and they're there every day, then you ha can have joy in your life. Well, no sooner would we chosen the theme and started writing the study guide and devotional around that theme, than it felt like the world went crazy in Europe when Russia invaded the Ukraine. And people, um, incredible suffering still in the Ukraine. Now, when we don't have partners in a country, we look for another Christian organisation where we can partner and send support for them. So we chose ACT Alliance, ACT standing for Action by Churches Together. 
and they had contacts both in the Ukraine, in Slovakia, in Poland, in Romania, in Hungary, all the nations where people were fleeing. So we could send relief through them for basic items like your food, water, shelter, psychosocial support, all the things that you need to get re-established somewhere else uh, in the community. And of course then here in our own eastern states, um, so many people experiencing absolute total devastation. I, I find it hard to imagine if everything in your house becomes rubbish because of a flood. How hard is that to start absolutely again from scratch? I loved hearing from Joel Slabs in the red cap there and he talked about indigenous young people hopping into their boats and rescuing people off of rooftops but also experiencing trauma because you had to sail past people who were also desperate because your boat's full. And Jesse Skelly at the top there, he's one of the pastors that we have in New South Wales. And he opened his home on Tuesday nights so people could come for a meal and a debrief together and just to pray together. And that's like a little mini church that started on Tuesday nights as well for people struggling with the aftermath and trauma of the floods. And it's been lovely to be able to send on some aid as people have generously supported that appeal. So the good uh, pantry at Lismore, we sent another $15,000 this past week, but we've been supporting different churches as they've reached out to the community and also groups like that. And our partners in Vietnam, for instance, but most of our partners who struggled with COVID, we ran an appeal for them. And they've talked about how they could supply three times the amount of support to their local community as what they could in a normal year because of the relief um, parcels that were provided that they could buy and three new church groups have started as well in Vietnam which was so encouraging to hear. Some of the internally displaced people groups in South Sudan um, have built basic bush structures to meet in for church and one of the things they were thankful for was just being able to have tarpaulins that you could put over the roof so that um, during rainy seasons you could still meet. I love their ocul safety. I wouldn't want to be the man at the very top, but oh, we've been in places like that. It's amazing what they can do. And Paulino, one of our main partners in South Sudan, um, he looked at rain and how over the last 20 years rainfall is becoming later and later. And he suggested a tree planting project. So we've put in 5,000 seedlings to date and they've been doing really well. But he's chosen mainly fruit trees so that people can have food as well as shade, as well as hopefully making a difference for the climate. We also sent four farmers across to Uganda from South Sudan to learn some um, different foundations for farming techniques. We had been supplying oxen and ploughs, but they're quite expensive and everybody wants them all at once. So this was looking at how to test the soil and look what sort of balance you need to have a good soil to grow crops in, how to mulch, how to use simple everyday things to make a difference to double or triple your crops. They came back very excited. It's supposed to be a three-year project, a pilot project, where they test this out in their community and then share the results. But the farmers came back talking about it to all the farmers, so I think most of the farmers are giving it a whirl. This is a very um, special place, I think, for the Harbour Church of Christ at Emmanuel School. There's a couple of very special kids you've been really close to and partnering with. One of the aims when we partner in a, a nation overseas is not to just give them a handout, not just welfare, that you've got to keep on giving handouts, but how can we make a difference that makes them self-sustaining? So one of the things they asked for was a herd of goats. So all the caregivers from year eight right down to year one, if they wanted them, were provided with a billy goat and two nanny goats. Nanny goats can give birth to baby kids every six months, so that herd can grow fairly quickly. So the first year we offer education for free, the next year they're asked to either sell the milk or the goat um, and raise the money for the school fees and the year after it's the uniform as well as the school fees. And they've been telling us that they've been able to buy shoes, medical supplies as well and bless the whole family through that program. Well, Emmanuel School was only 240 students when they 
first started, kids who were displaced, they'd come living in the community, but often they were orphaned um, because of the Civil War. And other schools round about were watching. That school's grown to over a thousand students now. Other schools were watching on and said, can we have a program like that? 10 schools have asked, can we please have a GOAT program for our school too? So it was very exciting to be able to um, make a difference for Tiara Liette. It's the first school we've been able to help this year um, to give them GOATs for their school as well, which they're very appreciative of. In places like Zimbabwe, before the COVID lockdown happened, some churches like Game Church were only six months old. And when lockdown came, there was this great fear, what will happen to new believers when they can't go on and meet together and grow together in God? But they've been using things like WhatsApp so that they can share sermons and messages and keep in touch. And it was lovely to hear from BJ that during COVID, they've been able to extend church buildings. They've been able to mold and make bricks still. Um, he's encouraging them to do that. And churches are now back again meeting together, for which we thank God. We were very excited in May for two of our um, staff members, um, part of COCO, Churches of Christ Overseas Aid, who could actually go to Zimbabwe and visit. That's the first time in about three years they've been able to go and actually see programs um, that we run, projects that we partner with in action. Because the whole idea is that you talk to people in the community, it's not just to bless a limited number of people, it's to bless a whole community with each of these programs. And so they're able to go to Kailishli Children's Village and see that school had still been able to happen. And three students had actually passed really well, they're year 13 at the end of last year. And Sisawenkosi has put in to do an agricultural course at university. So that was really encouraging. The kids that they have come and are placed by the social welfare department, and they always try very hard. Can they find extended family for these kids to live with and support them to live with extended family? Because that is the best option. But if they can't, they stay there. And even when they finish school, if they're not good enough to go on to university or that's not their choice, they encourage them to get a trade of some description, whether it's carpentry or an electrician or plumber or whatever it is. And this lad in the blue T-shirt there, he chose upholstery. And he got a lot of joy, and KCV got a lot of joy out of him recovering an old lounge suite that they had, making it look like a new one again. Eva and Colin, the two staff members who went, um, got to see what it looks like when a well is put in in Zimbabwe. And it starts with a community gathering, because it's not just for the church, it's for the whole community. And people are trained in how to look after their well. and so. Boniface, who's the director of Showers of Blessing, does a lot of the teaching, as does Natando, the field officer, and talks to them about how do you um, have good hygiene, how do you get the best out of your well. And people take notes because they're responsible for their well and they can ask questions and have discussion groups around it. And typically there is this happy dance. They chose us. We get to have a well that's close because it saves them so much time in a day carrying heavy buckets of water for their family. So the rig comes in, the guys in the community help with putting in the pumps and the pipe work and then the cement apron around the pump is put in so that they get good drainage away from the well so it's not just boggy and wet. And then, of course, the celebration of beautiful clean water that won't give you cholera or dysentery or any other disease coming out of that um, well there, which is a great joy for them. Now, you're all fairly familiar with this, I think. Safe Water September. <laughs> it is actually a challenge. It's not that easy to do it. Um, I've admired Peter, and there's been a few, I think, here who've really taken up the challenge. For me, Personally, when I do the challenge, I'm very aware every time I turn on a tap, have a shower in hot water, just can go to the sink and grab a glass of water, just what a privilege that is. You know, it's something like one in 10 <laughs> who can do that, the rest of the world struggle. And that statistic, more than 3.5 million people every year die because of water and sanitation related 
diseases. And you think that's such a preventable sickness that you can make a difference for. So although it is a challenge, it's got a beautiful result. So whether you take the challenge or support those who take the challenge, thank you because it makes a huge difference. So if you're willing to sign up, safewaterseptember.org.au, a whole month drinking nothing but water, hot or cold, and getting people to sponsor you to make a beautiful difference for people overseas. And it's not just wells in Zimbabwe, it's water tanks in Vanuatu and toilets in Bangladesh as well that make such a difference for those communities. For the first 100 that sign up and get $50 on their profile, it's a free drink bottle. And this year they've also got a beanie. If anybody's interested in a beanie, you can only do a church order, but you do have to buy the beanie. It's $17 and there's $13 postage and handling to share between the group. Our young people, our Embody group, came up with the whole concept of Safe Water September. And they've also got a whole group of young people that connect across Australia by Zoom. And um, they do things like book clubs, Make Poverty Personal by Ash Barker, I think was the most recent book they've been going through together. But they also interview other young people that are engaged in mission and social justice, both here in Australia and our partners overseas. So if you wanna hear Natando share his story, you can find that on Mission Unplugged. And then here in Australia, I loved hearing this story about a young man who was really nervous and fearful about COVID and he was in Port Hedland. One of his friends said, well, why don't you go to a church and talk to somebody? And so he did. He went to a church, he got given a Bible um, and went to the Port Hedland Indigenous Church. And uh, he went away, read it, came back, kept asking questions, got encouraged. And on the fifth week, he actually came to church and he came carrying a towel and he asked, could he please be baptised? So after church, they went down to Pretty Pool and on his confession of faith and prayer to receive Christ, he was baptised. So that's a beautiful God at work in all our communities moment. One of the new programs we've started this year is the Pathways Program, where a young Indigenous person who's passionate for God is mentored by an older Indigenous Christian and given practical ministry opportunities in a way that's culturally relevant for them. And some of you may know Sonny and Fran Graham in Esperance, but they're hoping that one of those young leaders might come to Esperance and take over the ministry there. I recently did the Churches of Christ History and Identity course and our State Minister, Peter Barney, asked the question of all of our Churches of Christ ministers across Australia, who is the most well-known, the most famous of all of our ministers? My head went to Gordon Sterling because we have the Sterling lectures. No, nobody came up with the answer, which is Sir Douglas Nichols, this multi-talented professional athlete a church planter and pastor, an indigenous advocate, governor of South Australia, knighted by the queen, audience with the Pope, this amazing influential figure who brought pride and hope to his own people. And he made this beautiful statement. He bridged cultures amazingly well. And he said, we belong to the great family of God. And he's made out of one blood, all nations. What an inclusive, beautiful, all-embracing statement. I love the truth of that. And the partners that we share with, their family, we belong together. We're all going to be seated at the king's table, at the wedding feast. All have accepted that invitation. I was very excited to see during NAIDOC week in Wednesday's advertiser during, was, was last week, um, that Sir Douglas Nicol got honoured 50 years after he was the first Indigenous person to be knighted by the Queen, honoured with a stamp. He is still remembered in our culture. There's so many stories I could tell, and I've given you the tip of the iceberg, and you're probably glad that's all you had from me because it could be very long. But you may have noticed, and we've actually put out, if you'd like to know, how do I partner? There's so many things that are going on. So One Pledge is a way where you subscribe every month. You can choose how much you um, donate, but it's a monthly donation. And you get an email back 
a story from one of our partners, God at work and what he's doing among them. We did put out a little flyer in the Kurong magazines as well that went out. And if you get Eternity magazine, I'm not sure if you use that here, on page 12, there's a story about one pledge. And I am going to put a few things on a table in a moment. I so forgot before church I was doing other things and chatting. At any rate, I will put them out there. And there is an annual report. It's last year's because we're only just writing this year's. But there's some beautiful stories of God at work. And there's a biro, if you'd like one, that's got our web address on it. There, I've also got some more of the mid-year ones, which talks about after five years of hard work, we have been fully accredited, which means all our tax deductible programs, our COCO aid and relief um, programs, are now tax deductible and also accredited by the Australian government. So the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade actually prefers to work together with Christian organisations because they know they get five times the return on the money invested than if you sent it to a government and then it gets distributed many ways. Um, and so on some of our projects now, you'll see like behind Varna and the tube wells that are starting, that's a new project that is starting in Bangladesh, you'll see Australian aid written on it as well as the GMP logo. And that gives Varna um, the ability to meet with other NGOs and when the Bangladeshi government comes to inspect programs and runs programs, he gets a seat at the table. And so you get known by the government as doing something for the people, especially in the Barnabin Hills where some of the most marginalised people live. There is so many more stories. The, the um, website has a lot more information and if you want to keep up with the latest and you're on Facebook or Instagram, you'll find it there. But I just wanted to say thank you because a lot of those stories are stories that you have partnered with and made a difference. So I can tell you those stories because people just like you. Wonderful thing. Some of you will know the people in that picture. We've been to Vanuatu. We've been to Lenai Church. Um, I actually took that photo. Um, so <laughs> it's very special. But thank you from all of our partners. We were a little bit sad to hear when we went with teams to Vanuatu. Um, George Ashley was one of the people that helped us to get established and organise things there. And he passed away um, this last week. But you have made an incredible difference. And I just want to say thank you for so many of those stories coming from here. Father God, bless this church. From here, may the invitation go out both locally here in Victor Harbour and well beyond. Come, there's a seat for you. The Father who made you and loves you invites you to the wedding feast of his son. Don't delay, it's the biggest rock, the foundation of life. Put it in first, make it a priority and may the glory be yours, Lord God. In your name we pray, amen.